two, one. Thank you and good morning everyone. Thank you for joining the uh, Public Safety Committee work session of Monday, April 15, 2024. Uh, the Councilmember Mink will be joining us at, at some point soon, I believe. Today we have three topics on the agenda. The operating budgets for the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services. As we begin, I want to thank Kristen Cummings and then also Susan Farag for preparing most informative, once again, uh, preparing most informative packets for us. And unless Councilmember yeah. Lukey has anything to say, we're going to ask the panel to please introduce themselves and then we're going to ask Ms. Cummings to walk us through the packet. I think it should be noted that as in every topic, the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security is already prepared. They're right there at the table. So. <laughs> Good morning, council members. Thank you for having me. Luke Hodgson. I'm the director of emergency management and homeland security. Good morning, Alicia Singh, Office of Management and Budget. Good morning, Willie Morales, Office of Management and Budget. Thank you all. Ms. Cummings, please. Good morning, everyone. Today we have an overview of the FY25 proposed operating budget for the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. So in the recommended budget this year, um, the total recommended budget is $4,766,028, which is an increase of $644,978, um, or 15.7%. Um, I did want to note this number is a little different from the figures in the chart on the first page. This is due to a $300,000 um, enhancement that came through the uh, County Executive after the original budget was released. Um, before we go over some key changes, I would like to turn it over to the Director of the Department, Luke. Please. Sure. So I, I realize that you two are very familiar with what the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security does, but for those who uh, watch the budget sessions, I'm not sure they always are, so I always like to take this opportunity just to explain that the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security is responsible for planning coordinating, preventing, preparing for, and protecting against major threats anywhere in our community um, that may harm or disrupt our community, our commerce, or our, our way of life. Um, and then it, we move into effectively managing multiple agency response so that we have a coordinated uh, response and recovery to those sorts of events. Um, some of the work that OMHS has done in the past year, um, we've worked with the Office of Grants Management to award 136 applicants with a total of $900,000 uh, for our nonprofit security grant program that protects uh, against hate crimes. In October of 2023, following the outbreak of violence in the Gaza Strip, uh, we awarded an additional $311,000 to 74 applicants um, who were experiencing the same um, threats of hate. On behalf of all of the county agencies, we've been working for several years now um, to pursue reimbursement through the COVID public assistance program. Um, we've submitted $218 million on behalf of the county. Of that, $100 million has been received by the county, and the remaining $118 million remains in various forms or stages of review with FEMA. We've applied for, received, and managed uh, $4.6 million in grants this past year uh, that have come from the Federal Homeland Security uh, uh, Grant Program. We've responded to 49 distinct emergency events. That includes building fires, flooding, evacuations, emergency notifications, weather events, gas leaks, water disruptions, civil disturbances, hazardous material spills, air quality degradations, and community, uh, inter I'm sorry, communications interruptions, among others. Uh, we have been very responsive to climate change, as uh, the rest of the government has been. Uh, this past year, we've hired a hydrologist uh, to monitor some of our water flow, which has become one of our major threats. Um, we've also hired a climate adaptation program manager. We've installed 35 flood sensors in the county's most frequently flooded sites so that our public safety agencies and DOT are notified very early when we have impending flooding so that we can avoid folks getting into those sorts of situations. Uh, we completed our draft 2024 hazard mitigation plan, which is now at the state and FEMA for review. Um, in 2023, the spring and fall of 2023, both times we completed updates to our extreme temperature plan, um, and that has uh, contributed to our heat and our cold emergencies that you all um, help us manage. 
Uh, we submitted three grant applications for several million dollars on behalf of OEMHS, uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, and WSSC um, in support of hazard mitigation projects to uh, mitigate the impacts of, of future disasters. Um, recently, as you all know, just this past month, we uh, pushed through the uh, 2024 Emergency Operations Plan, which was adopted by Council in March. Um, and we've conducted dozens of training exercises on topics such as continuity of operations, facility emergency action planning, active assailant response, emergency operations center participation, uh, securing houses of worship, and then school safety. As you know, earlier this year, we assumed uh, responsibility for the management of the Montgomery County Respite Center, where we provide transitional care services and resettlement for migrants arriving in the county. And we're currently working on federal funding to continue that service in the coming year. We continue to engage our community in a number of ways so that we can build their resilience. Uh, we've stepped up our public outreach efforts in this post-COVID uh, time, where we now have some more events to actually attend. Um, we provide numerous speaking and tabling outreach events to increase community awareness and resiliency. And at the end of calendar year 2023, Alert Montgomery, which is our public notification system, has 236,763 registered contacts, which is the largest mass notification system in Maryland, and that grows 1 to 3 percent every month. Where? So that's a little bit of what we do. Um, and then looking forward, what we're doing, I think we're going to get into that uh, in just a moment here. I think what you'll see is what we're, what we're looking to do is just continue um, our, our same um, MO here, uh, but expand it a little bit and build some additional capabilities. But in order to do that, we need to maintain our, our level of uh, staffing. So I think I'll turn that back over to you, Kristen. Does that work? Okay. Thank you so much, Luke. So to go over some key changes in the budget for this year, um, the first major change is that $900,000 have been integrated into the base budget towards the nonprofit security uh, grant program. Um, this was previously considered one-time funding, and it is now considered ongoing funding within the department. Um, just to note, through the um, program, it provides funding for nonprofit and faith-based organizations to augment costs for security personnel and other security planning measures. In FY24, 150 applications were received through this program, um, requesting grant awards for more than $2.8 million total. Um, along with the $900,000, uh, the county executive, as mentioned before, added an additional $300,000 expenditure um, in one-time funding for this uh, program. The second key change. Well, do you want to go stop and we'll do each one? I just, I have a comment for that. First of it says in the packet it's considered on-time funding. And I'll tell you, it is. It, it's one-time funding and on-time funding. But it's my understanding that we've had a, um, a rash of uh, houses of worship being broken into. Uh, I think it's mostly mosques, uh, but but so how are we working on that? What is being done to to uh, to stop or to help uh, stop that? Well, as you know, the uh, nonprofit security grant program is meant to uh, deal with issues of basis and, and hate. Um, what's going on right now that you hear a lot of these um, burglaries that are going on at houses of worship are actually part of an organized crime ring that they're simply looking for valuables it's a crime of opportunity um, no real hate or bias that we can identify that's that's involved in that obviously our police partners are, are on top of that um, nonetheless a lot of the the work that goes into the nonprofit security grant can help fortify those uh, houses of worship so um, we do trainings where we talk about how to secure their houses of worship and that is simply you know good security hygiene um, there are security cameras that are provided through this um, there's just a more of a e even if it's not hate correct or considered I, to be right hate. I mean that that's what the basis of their application is but yeah. obviously those come in handy should they have a break-in and they have all this evidence at this point so it's almost a dual purpose it's an unintended consequence it's unfortunate that it's needed at this time but it is excellent that all of these houses of worship have been outfitted with these sorts of uh, tools through the nonprofit security grant program. Well, and that was my concern. I, you know, the bureaucracy shouldn't shouldn't get in the way of doing the right thing. And if there was a problem that that they couldn't get to these grants, 
then if we needed to think about change in legislation or how we would change it, et cetera, I, I was necessary. So I'm going to argue. Go ahead, please. So um, thank you for that. And, you know, certainly knowing that that in the in the hate crimes and hate bias arena, things have been on an on the on the wrong trajectory, shall we say? Um, understanding that, um, you know, given the amount of money that has been infused into assisting with these types of things to provide hardening and cameras and other security strengthening measures, um, is there an expectation that that will level off at a certain point once? all these different preventive measures and education, and obviously the education should be ongoing, right? People, personnel changes within the houses of worship and we need to keep doing our best to educate, not just those who take care of the, the house of worship directly, but the community members as well. Um, so could you speak to that in terms of where you see this heading in the long run? Yeah, I mean, I think our hope with that is, well, A, to make people feel safe and secure being who they are, worshiping how they'd like in this community. Mm -hmm. They should be able to be whoever they want to be. That's our number one priority. Um, I think the, the second priority there is a deterrence factor, is knowing that, you know, the, the, these crimes of opportunities where house of worship used to always be unlocked and you could walk in and traverse the, the, the premises, uh, that has obviously changed for a lot of these folks. Um, the security cameras, the hardening, as you said, just the awareness, um, the vigilance that people have, I think all of those things go to a deterrence and starting to ask questions and a hyper awareness that hopefully will lead to deterring folks. Hate, unfortunately, is something that is very, very difficult to overcome. And um, those, I think, motivated by it will defeat a lot of our uh, our protections nonetheless so I think that's all the more reason why we need to stay on top of this grant program we need to be to, to Councilmember Katz's point we need to be a little more innovative and not restrictive in what we're doing that we're doing the same thing every single year because we may not see the results we need uh, we may need to adjust what we're doing and what's, what's an allowable expense but um, I would certainly hope that we'll, we'd see something level off but as our global tensions increase, I think it's only reasonable to expect that, that hate and bias to continue. Um, and will it subside? I think only time will tell. Well, and I know, you know, for example, it, in using two different um, incidents of mass violence that garnered national attention, one which was clearly a hate-motivated, the Tree of Life synagogue, and one which was not, which was more domestic dispute, but resulted in extreme amount of casualties down in Springland, Texas. Those two had different motives, but at the, at the heart of it was a grievance against right. a person or group of people that were subjected to that violence in their house of worship. Um, and so, you know, I know that particularly given the international landscape right now, we are focused on hate bias as a whole and I've, I've spent a lot of time in that in that world but I don't want to disregard the overall uh, best practices for any mass gatherings whether in a house of worship or you know in a community center what have you which may be targeted by um, by those who wish to carry out mass violence I agree and I think what you've seen is that we have this criteria to streamline exactly what qualifies for this funding. Mm -hmm. And it is some sort of demonstration that folks feel threatened by hate. They don't necessarily need to be subjected to it and have a prior incident, but for whatever reason, they can articulate that they feel like they may be a target of hate. We are open to that and we're open to supporting them. I think to your point, the definition, the traditional definition, and certainly the federal definition of a hate crime mm -hmm. is very narrow in focus. And if we, if we look at uh, aggrieved persons that are going to become violent offenders versus simply those motivated by the typical definition of hate, in the end, it has the same outcome, like Correct. you said. And, and that's what really matters. And I think that's why we need to continue to look at this grant program and what our allowable expenses, not forgetting what the underlying motivation for this is what we're trying to address but at the same time understanding that there's a little bit more to protecting houses of worship and our mass gatherings and um, and our soft targets than what we traditionally limited to simply those that can articulate some sort of hate or bias incident thank you go ahead please 
Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to note that I was at the Wat Thais uh, gathering yesterday, and this was certainly a topic of discussion there. Um, Captain Satinsky was also there, so MCPD is very well engaged, um, and there are, you know, certainly uh, uh, temples, mosques, uh, Indian houses of worship, and that this is a pattern that they have seen in previous years, and I understand that federal authorities are, are potentially looking at this as well. So many people are engaged, and I'm glad that we're doing our part as a county also uh, where, where possible to support that work and to support the community. Just wanted to also note that um, as we continue to look at the evolution of the grants program and our security efforts in this space, that we are um, looking at potentially leveraging our existing relationships with the county uh, security uh, security Services Division, where it might make sense to do that. Obviously, this is kind of an evolving space, and so looking at how uh, our, the county's aggregate spending uh, interacts with private sector, faith-based, nonprofit, and so on, I think that's certainly something that's going to make sense to continue to keep our eyes on. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Please. The second key change in the budget for this year um, has to do with personnel. So there is a, um, a 3.5 total FTE increase in the budget this year. Um, one FTE is due to a position that was created in FY24 um, that hasn't been staffed yet um, and a little bit of a technical adjustment. But 2.5 um, go towards um, FTEs associated with the Regional Preparedness Program. So um, previously this was um, funded through grant funding and actually was done so for 19 years. Um, the awarding agency, the National Capital Region Homeland Security Executive Committee, has made the decision to um, shift their funding model a bit. Um, and they have set out a schedule to gradually transition positions that were once funded through this grant to local budgets. Um, this is projected to take several years. Uh, last year, the department actually lost funding for 0 0.5 FTE um, that they were able to cover through other grants um, to bridge the gap at some cost to exercises and other, you know, otherwise planned activities. Um, and this year, they're losing funding for an additional two FTEs. Um, we did just want to note that in future years, there may be other positions impacted by this funding shift. Um, in addition to the 2.5 that we're discussing today, there are 3.5 additional FTEs that um, are associated with the regional preparedness system. And um, these support emergency management specialist positions, which are um, key infrastructure within the department. Um, there's quite a long list of all of the many things that they do um, within the packet, um, including planning, training, exercise work, um, being deployed to the field or emergency operations center during large scale emergencies. Um, and um, are there any comments before we? My, and I know that we're gonna need to put one because it's of air system, the new and enhanced program we have a new list and, you know, we can't directly. But I almost believe that we're going to need to do, especially in, in instances like you just named, we need to either have an asterisk or a subset or something on our list that explains why there's going to be things that are really new new and uh, for the first time, and there are things that really are not, that they've been funded in different ways. And I see Mr. Howard shaking his head here so, in, in the affirmative. I, I don't want to, you yeah. know. Yes, it, as we track the committee's discussions and decisions, um, we will certainly you know, have two things. One, we'll uh, be able to categorize things, you know, specifically um, items that are switching, proposed items that are switching from grant funding to, to county general funds. Yeah, and there we go. Most of those will be things that have already been, um, been being done by departments, some for several years, some some newer, um, and so we'll note that. And we'll also include text to explain what the actual shift is and the potential, um, you know, and what it means. Like for example, these positions are filled um, in in OEMHS. Um, some some of the things that are shipped potential potentially shifting from grant funding to county funding are contractual services currently. So there there could be some variation, and we'll be sure to note that in and kind of categorize it and track it in a way that's that's most helpful for the council. 
I was going to add to that it's helpful to know particularly when adjustments need to be made where something um, is newly required right so there's 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 new programs or there's new because it's not grant funded it's going into general funds and then there's and you must do this because right and that needs to be specified yes and, and to clarify items that are uh, new items that are required by some law policy mm -hmm. etc I'm under the council president's guidance do not need to to go on that new and enhanced programs list because they are there's a specific requirement that we must do them so again those will be tracked and and um, and notified and asterisked um, for you all to, to the best extent that we can um, but just to clarify some of those um, items will not be showing up on the new enhanced programs list because they are required but will they be in their own separate category as um, or just part of the rest of the package. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. <laughs> you're going to need a lot of symbols. Yes, is is what will. I'm saying. Yes. We will. We will. We will be sure to to um, to make sure that is clarified. Okay. You know, as, as we um, share the different tracking lists. And then um, a correct uh, question for you, Director. I tried to say question and director at the same time. A question for you, Director Hodgson. Um, uh, I know this is an increase in full-time employees, and I just wanted to get a sense of. Um, how many oh, during like calendar year 2023 how many employees like left or changed or what was the delta on on our workforce within OE HMS so just take a step back when you said there's an increase in FTEs this is not an increase in FTEs. right it's a so this, the, switch yeah, the, right the chairman Katz's uh, point that that is exactly what's going on here is that this is just maintaining level service so while it's an enhancement or something new to our budget, it is just maintaining level service. Um, to, to your question, um, I, you know, we had, I think, three retirements in um, FY24, and I think we had one resignation uh, during the year. So uh, most of the, the um, personnel have been stable there, um, which is exactly what we want to do here. This is one of the reasons, I think, and, and Dr. Stoddard, who's here, actually sits on the Homeland Security Executive Committee. But one of the reasons is not only to free up grant dollars, but to provide some more stability. Because we do have issues retaining folks, uh, let alone recruiting them, when we say that these are grant dollars and the future is uncertain right. with them. Right. And just to show you exactly how much, uh, to Kristen's point, exactly how much of an impact the federal grant dollars have, we have 23 positions in OEMHS. 14 of those are fully funded by a federal grant. So that's 61% of our personnel are funded by federal grants, which is a tremendous benefit to the county. Um, and that is traditionally how emergency management and homeland security in the United States is funded, is federally funded, is locally executed. The problem is we're at the behest and mercy of the federal government at that point. So as they recently passed an appropriation for the Department of Homeland Security that called for a 10% cut to the Homeland Security grant program, that may disproportionately impact the staffing dollars that we get, that we won't lose 10% of our staffing dollars. They could cut the staffing completely, and that would make up, that would comprise the entirety of the 10% of the cut. I don't think that's likely, um, but nonetheless, I think we might get a disproportionate amount of that 10 percent, and we'll see that in all of our local emergency management agencies, not just here in Montgomery County. One of the issues is syncing up our budget with the federal budget. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that this uh, appropriation exists. We know that it will manifest in the way of a budget at some point, and at that point, we will get an award letter, and that will probably be in September or October. And the award letter is basically a check. I mean, it's a reimbursement grant, but it's, it's guaranteeing you that you will get these dollars. So in September or October, we know exactly how much money we're getting. By January, we need to be funding those positions. Mm -hmm. So we have a very little time to adjust if we get a significant cut. So that's why I appreciate you all being open to understanding how these grant dollars work and for Kristen pointing out that um, there may be further impacts in the future. It's, there's just a lot of uncertainty right now with that. And, and to that end, because we, we can't control the federal government and that it's on a different uh, fiscal year than, than mm -hmm. we are as the state of Maryland and as Montgomery County, um, 
I, you know, I think it's prudent to make sure we are accommodating for that and planning ahead. <laughs> I don't have to tell that to a bunch of people <laughs> in emergency management, but that fiscally we need to do that, right? Because we don't want to be caught in a situation where we haven't maintained an adequate buffer to ensure that we're continuing um, the, the, the same level of services. So thank you. I appreciate that support. Please. The last thing we wanted to note is that there is a net reduction of $96,331, which are related to compensation and other adjustments, uh, primarily due to an increase in the assumed departmental lapse is based on OMB's updated lapse review across departments. Um, based on the Council President's budget approach guidance, the nonprofit security grant enhancement from the county executive of $300,000 uh, one-time funding and the shift in funding for the regional preparedness program from federal grant to general fund would be placed on the new enhanced programs list. The operating budget equity tool um, developed by the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice um, has been used this year to assess the impact of programs uh, by centering race in pursuit of equity and justice. Their departments are rated on an 11 point scale and um, the emergency management and Homeland Security um, received six out of 11 stars this year. Um, and they shared that they, for this upcoming year, they're always interested in enhancing the department services to better serve the RESJ mission and that their liaison will continue to work with ORESJ for suggestions on how department efforts can be enhanced to further the mission. And with that, council staff recommends that the committee approve the FY25 proposed operating budget for the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security as submitted by the executive, placing the nonprofit security grant amendment and the regional preparedness program expenditures into the new and enhanced program list. Do we have any questions? Fine with that. You got three three yeses. I always say take yeses and answers. So uh, anyhow, sounds good. Thank you all very very much for everything you do. Thank you all. It, very it much. is comforting to know you were there. It truly is. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we're having a changing of the guard here. I notice Ms. Farag is coming to the to the uh, table, and we're going to ask. Uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation to please join us as a, at the panel table. You okay? You okay? Well, wow. and you did a great job. You really did. Yeah, it was very impressive. <laughs> We run out of seats at the panel. All right, we're good. Okay, if the panel, Mr. Stevenson and others, could please introduce themselves, sure. and then we're going to turn to Ms. Farag. Uh, good morning, Ben Stevenson, Director of the Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. Frederick Cabello, Warden, Department of Corrections. Kate Beckley, Management Services Division Chief. Stephen Murphy, Division Chief, Medical and Behavioral Health Services. Ivan Downing, Division Chief of Community Corrections. Thank you all. And we, I guess you should introduce yourself a second time. It's still you. I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> Willie Morales with the Office of Management and Budget. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farag, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, for the recommended FY25 operating budget for corrections, there is about a nine. 0.56% increase. That's mostly compensation driven by co compensation. For all intents and purposes, this is a same services budget. There is one elimination of a long term vacancy um, in pre release and re entry services for a savings of $85,000. It has been vacant. So, again, even though it shows as a service impact, it's not really impacting from year over year at this point. Um, Wait, yeah, when that when for the what is a PAA? I meant to it call you and public administrative aid principal yeah. administrative. Sorry, principal administrative aid. Yeah. I, it, I apologize. It, not it's a, a problem. Guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I even looked it up to, be, to avoid asking, but couldn't come up with it. So, okay, thank you. 
Um, I'm just going to go line item. Please, line if item we will we will line. stop you if we need to. The next one is the overtime adjustment for about one point nine million dollars. Last year, the department's budgeted overtime was three point one million, and the recommended budget is increasing by one point nine for a total of five million in FY twenty five. Uh, we have this conversation, it seems, with every single public safety department. The Department of Corrections has a projected annual overtime cost of about $10.5 million, so it's not appropriately budgeted, right? And, and this is a concern throughout public safety, and particularly in corrections and fire, where they have mandatory posts 24-7. Um, the committee may wish to better understand the growing overtime deficit and what plans the uh, department has to address it for future years. They have listed some of the driving factors, uh, including 43 correctional officer vacancies, 40 hours of in-service training required for each correctional officer, regular leave use by the correctional officers, and they indicate that officers take um, an average of eight officers take leave each day. 19 correctional officers are on leave due to injuries, and there are several projects that require additional overtime, including replacing lights, intercoms, and an elevator. Ms. Did you want to add to that list or? No, I just want to note that uh, to speak about what we're doing to meet those challenges of the vacancies, we're 2% higher than what we were last year as far as the vacancies in uniformed. Uh, we are uh, making every job fair. We're looking at these hard to fill positions by doing more mo marketing internally, whether social media, LinkedIn. Uh, we are focused on, we had a one day hiring event most recently, which uh, resulted in a number of potential candidates. And through that, we're expecting to see anywhere from 15 to 20, hopefully, to be soon to hired. And so we do believe once we fill some of these, we, we know that when we fill some of these vacancies, our overtime drivers are going to go down. And so uh, we have have a little bit of improvement from last year with nurses. Last year, I came to the table with eight vacancies. We are she down did. to three. And so that is phenomenal, and that has taken some time. And we're seeing a little bit of the post-COVID uh, stranglehold of all those bonuses from those big hospitals put out that we just never will be able to compete with. So I just wanted to make note that those are some of our specific things we're working on. Just wanted to check in on the um, the leave due to injuries. Obviously, the kind of daily regular leave taking that's a part of the cost of doing business, and that's you know barring obviously you know abuse or something like that. But this, that's that's a standard part of business. But the injuries um, is there. Uh, uh, is that an unusual number there? Um, would the department benefit from like an external risk management study? As the is the has the union raised questions about it? Anything on that? Uh, front? We actually uh, with the union we've agreed to meet in a non LMRC way to talk about security concerns because we we are concerned with the safety of the officers. Uh, a couple of the drivers that are maybe <coughs> increasing these numbers, and I, I can't give you comparative numbers, but I can say with the 33 people that we have. Uh, that are sentenced to the Maryland Department of Health that we are holding without treatment and without commitment. Uh, those cases are very sick individuals, many of which that do require hands-on for their own health and safety. Uh, when we've met, uh, additionally meeting with uh, the LMRC or with our meetings on security, we have looked at uh, other ways to mitigate that risk. This past year, we have done a pilot study on cells that eliminate uh, toilets from being flushed frequently in flooding a cell, which has caused a number of injuries to both inmate as well as the uh, staff members. And so we've put in no flush toilets in our disciplinary seg and a portion of it, which we're finding does also reduce some of that uh, safety concerns of people getting injured. And so we are down for those being injured over the year from the beginning of the year to down. And so I'm, uh, I'm positive that we're in the right trajectory. But yes, I do believe we could look at any opportunities, again, above and beyond what we are doing to see what we can do to make it safer. Thank you. And the, uh, you know, the point that you raise about kind of our, our inadequate mental health facilities and, and, you know, certain care for that, obviously, Countywide, that's something that we're looking at, and statewide, that's something that's being looked at. But that certainly raises another reason of why this is a priority. Yes, and Councilmember Mick, if I just I wanted to add on that mental health piece, we are coming back. We're working with the courts, the state's attorney's office, our health and human service partners to look at a se sequential intercept model training and collaborative event on May 28th and 29th. This is for us to look at all different points of the process in which the inmates come in where we can close up service gaps and possibly help reduce some of those that are in crisis that could 
uh, cause us more. And I know in the fall we're talking about another work group as well. So we're excited to be part of that post-COVID to see, because I think it is time to relook at what we do and s make sure that it makes sense to what we're going through right now. Thank you. All right, well, I have to applaud you for reminding everyone about the sequential intercept model uh, symposium that's coming up. Judge Bonifant would be very happy that you said that. Um, and, and I am incredibly happy that we are doing that and taking that deep dive look into our own system and our own gaps. Of course, as you and I have spoken many times, um, there's only so much we can do locally because of the way the, the state facilities need to be credentialed and need to be operated. And so um, the, the unfortunate situation based on the landscape we are living in um, is that there aren't nearly enough beds just to deal with the criminally involved forensic psychiatric patients, let alone those who, who might, may need civil commitment but haven't been criminally involved or haven't been charged with a crime and that's creating the other issues we have in our, in our acute medical facilities where acute med beds are being taken up long term by psychiatric patients um, who need uh, regular ongoing care. Um, in terms of the, the injuries, and, and, and I again want to thank you for all the different measures and creativity you've put in place to try and help reduce that. Um, knowing that there isn't going to be a quick fix on the uh, on the on the placement of um, inmates who need psychiatric placement, and knowing that that number has gone up exponentially <clears throat> over the past few years, um, and I and I haven't seen a, any downward swing in that regard. Um, what if anything? are you all looking at in terms of long-term strategic planning in that arena? Um, good question. Uh, what can we do? What can we take responsibility for and do a better job is how we've looked at it internally. A couple things that are going on and not to take you through the weeds, but we're looking at a, a new dress down uniform, one to be more approachable, one to, uh, of course, we have emergency response teams that need outfitted differently, but a majority of our staff in de-escalating behavior, how do we look and how do we look to, to those we supervise? So that's one aspect we're looking at. Uh, another is uh, we're looking at some uh, leadership development programs. Some of our feedback from our most recent accreditation showed that during COVID, you lost a lot of people and you lost a lot of those that had historical knowledge and experience and what are you going to do differently to better train? And so we are going to train people more from a ground up level in building culture. It's very important for us to build culture to, to help de-escalate, to help understand that we're dealing with some very sick people and how do we do that the best. And so our department is looking internally as well as externally to, to, to bolster our training requirements. And so those are just a couple things that we, we think about and how we, how we can do things differently. Uh, we're also looking to collaborate more with HHS to look at diversion opportunities. Mm -hmm. There are cases that some of which we can't work with, but I can say we've been meeting regularly with the state uh, to, to identify anyone that's in our jail that we can uh, hopefully not have in our jail. Our object is those that can be, you know, um, that can uh, manage outside being in custody. So those are just a couple, but, but we are looking knowing that we're not, we may not be able to change the outcome of our numbers, but what can we do internally in working with our population? And I want to thank you and commend you on for, for those who are not in that in that subset of, of inmates um, for everything that you're doing in terms of job training and workforce development to make sure that those who are being released from your facility are prepared for the workforce um, when they come out. And and I note that there's a budgetary item related to the ovens. Yeah. And they are really, if, if I can say this loud enough, they are incredibly important both to the day in day and operations of feeding everyone there, as well as to the sweet release uh, bakery training program. And, and we have been the recipients of many a thing from sweet release at different events here at the council. And it's truly amazing to see the creativity and the pride that they have for what they're doing. And I know you're very proud of that too. So I'm just gonna say supporting the ovens very easy for me to do, so thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farag, please. Um, the next item is the really interesting and fascinating 
um, concept of lapse, which in case for people who don't know, lapse, it reflects personnel savings from vacant positions. Typically this is because there's a hiring lag to actually put somebody in a position and they capture that savings for the partial year where the position is vacant. But it's also used to basically freeze other positions to find additional savings within a budget. And that's what's happening here this year. There's a lapse adjustment of about $2.8 million. And that actually was put in place to help fund the overtime that the department needs. Um, and also reflects vacancy rates. My concern always in public safety departments is whether or not LAPS um, hinders in any way or negatively impacts their ability to hire their critical positions in the upcoming fiscal year, and they've advised that it does not. For the holiday pay premium, $430,000, this is um, reflecting the fact that holiday premiums have historically been underfunded in the department. It adjusts, it modifies holiday pay to reflect the general wage adjustments built into the base pay and also adds the Juneteenth holiday. The nurse retention bonus, which you talked about briefly, supports critical department operations for about 62,000. Uh, they currently have 24 correctional nurse positions. Um, at the time this was written, there were four vacant. Now apparently there's just three. Um, and the retention bonus is 5,000 per nurse. Charge back from the library for one half. Hit me if you have problems, yeah. right? <laughs> They're going to hit me up there. We're so there'll be a not, to. <laughs> not with me necessarily because they'd be hitting me all the time. Excuse me, Ms. Frog. Go ahead, please. The charge back for the library for a half position is about fifty-five thousand dollars. Current staffing is one point seven full-time equivalent positions at the library in the Montgomery County Correctional Facility. This would add a half position. Um, to them, the average daily population continues to increase, and the department advises that the current staffing complement at the library does not meet service demands. The next item is the 3% inflation adjustment to nonprofit service provider contracts for about $6,700. I was informed on Friday that this actually goes on your new and enhanced programs list, and it will be handled as a global issue um, further along in the budget, I believe, in front of GEO. Um, and, and there again, it should have a little asterisk or something yeah. to explain, to, uh, to remind us. And I've just listed out the, the um, current service providers. There is a shift of a tax supported chargebacks from corrections to the Office of the County Attorney for about $207,000. The department will continue to get those legal services from the County Attorney. It's just that the cost of that position will be housed over in the County Attorney's budget. The repair of kitchen equipment for the bakery program, as um, Councilmember Ludke mentioned, $140,000. This is uh, repairing ovens in MCCF. Uh, the money is coming from the Inmate Advisory Council Fund. Uh, this is a non-tax supported fund, special revenue fund, and it's, um, it or originates from commissions associated with the inmate commissary purchases. There is an inmate advisory council and the deputy warden of inmate services oversee this and any expenditures from the account must be approved by them specifically to benefit um, incarcerated individuals. If I could jump in there and I, you know, I'm certainly, some people couldn't even wait to talk about this. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I love but, but, <laughs> but bottom line is if the inmate fund had something else to do with this $140,000. I'd like to know that as well. I don't know that we should be, that for something like this, that I don't know that we should be counting or asking the inmates to pay for this if they have something else that they would also need. And so. Um, good question and hopefully not of larger concern because we do use it for a variety of different things. Evidence-based okay. programs, Choices for Change program, which we have a licensed social worker that does it for youthful offenders. We're also going to be using it for a wide-scale tablet system that will improve access to opportunities, education, visiting family connectedness. And so uh, we're this is one element in which they can benefit, and we have multiple graduating classes. Uh, so it would be used, and, and I will say many of us are benefiting from the bakery program. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, on some days it's just so good. But yeah. um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to detract from a larger grouping. And, and these are profits that are based on our commentary from, from Keefe is who we use. So I just don't believe it would. No, I think it's the right way to spend the profits. I really do. But... But you, you know my, my point earlier, and I also have to say very publicly, like everybody else is saying, the bakery program is not only terrific for 
first off, we were so glad you could bring it back. I mean, it really bothered everybody that you that you didn't have it. But the the people getting out of being incarcerated, this is a good occupation for all of them. I mean, this is, uh, you know, being a chef somewhere is, is a good deal. So it's a lot of work, but it's a good deal. So I think we need, and then the only other question would be, if there's anything else on that, not just a bakery, but something else that, we should be considering trying to help that person to not come back, uh, whether there's other programs that we should also be looking at and funding. We, we are, and I, I've identified the need for family-based programs such as parenting, a non-judgmental parenting program. Uh, we're working on abuser intervention program for domestic violence offenders. Some of this stuff we are, it's in our, our conversations of looking to see if we can have something that not just supports uh, our main jails, but also supports our pre-release program yep. and enhances them. So that is part of our conversations. Good. If you could keep us updated, I guess, in uh, maybe in the fall, whatever, that we should mm -hmm. get an update on anything else we can be doing and, and, and be funding, I think it would be a help to everybody. Okay. Absolutely. Good? Okay. Please, Ms. Frog. And the last thing is um, racial equity considerations. There are two items listed. One is the operating budget equity tool score and corrections score to six out of 11, which indicates commitment to the program. I talked a little bit about this with Director Stevenson and he indicated that their core team leader basically um, got poached by a different office within county government. And so they're kind of reformulating that as they get that position filled again. Um, one of the things that I've been looking at um, between the two budget, the FY24 and the FY25 was um, jails are in a unique position when it comes to racial equity um, work because all of the work, all the decision points to try to um, create more equity in the justice involved populations happen before people get to jail. So jails have to take who jails get, right? So what can you do within a jail to look at racial equity um, work and try to make things a little more um, balanced and fair. And one of the things that, one of the programs that I found, and this will partner great with the Sequential Intercept, is Council of State Governments and the National Association of Counties and the American Psychiatric Association Foundation have created specifically a racial equity approach called Stepping Up, and it targets incarcerated individuals of color who also have serious mental illness um, concerns. And I was hoping that this would be something the committee might be interested in and corrections could look at in more depth to really try to look at this through a racial equity lens. What is the demographics of the population that are under care for serious mental illness? Um, how many, you know, and what are they, what kind of um, programs are they receiving? There's already a very robust framework and program within DOCR from the time that somebody's intake during their intake, and that's um, the CATS assessment by Office of Human um, or DHHS individuals all the way through, and they have a step-down unit, they have appropriate units um, for this. And Director Stevenson was mentioning, you know, a lot of it is very hands-on, and there are people with really significant serious mental illness. The current um, backlog for state bed placement is 41, and that includes 34 individuals um, pending placement and seven pending competency hearings, right? So if we could, if it pleases the committee, if we could ask corrections to come back looking at this specifically through a racial equity lens, get the demographic data, see if there's any barriers to treatment because people that are um, persons of color who are also impacted by serious mental illness are much, much more likely to recidivate when released. I certainly applaud that and I agree with that. The only, and the other question that I have getting back for, as an example, the bakery program, if somebody, uh, it leaves the the jail and has not completed the program. Is there a way that they can get certified or whatever you're getting for them? We wouldn't have that ability at, at this moment. Uh, what we try to do is capture people early on. Uh, the case management team within our detention center are always screening people, looking for people, looking for sentenced people, and so we everything's like a, a running clock in corrections, even eligibility for the pre-release center. So yeah. uh, we just have to do a better job in looking at our time. But uh, we don't have the ability, since it's only located in our main jail, to be able to continue those services. Well, you know, maybe that's something that we should also sit down with our friends from Montgomery College. 
and see if there's a program somehow, some way, and not that somebody has to be incarcerated to get in that program. I'm not suggesting that at all. But if there's a way that we could get that person, you know, thank goodness you're out, let's keep you out. I mean, when, when I just read, it used to be, I used to use the figure of uh, 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 $45,000 to incarcerate somebody. I read recently at $60,000 or getting close to to incarcerate somebody. Yeah. And and if we can spend the money up front and not incarcerate, and that's always the first cost, and not doesn't, doesn't even call, count the the, the, uh, the the problems to the families, et cetera, et cetera. If we could keep someone out and be productive, I mean, there's people that necessarily have to be in corrections, but if we can, we, we're saving money, not in every way we can think about it. So I think that's another discussion we need to have uh, in, in the fall. Our chef comes from Montgomery College. Mm -hmm. So we, we, have, uh, we have further conversations that we need to have that continuity of care is how we, we talk about continuity it in our business. Cares. It's a way to say it. The other part is our, our bakery program right now is only working at MCCF. Eventually, we have the large dietary kitchen that was um, uh, created at the pre-release center in yeah. 2019. We would like to be able to utilize that space and have that continuity so if they do miss, we can catch them up later. And so those are things that we're looking at going into this operating year. So. Yeah, great. Go ahead, please. Um, and for GED programming, mm -hmm. yeah. where they're doing the adult correctional mm -hmm. ed programming, mm -hmm. um, is there something similar where if they're close to completing, you know, because again, mm -hmm. timing doesn't always mm -hmm. line up with that, um, are they able to continue at the pre-release center or transition into continuing once they're released back to the community? Yes, we do the transitioning planning for them, whether it be through Mon Montgomery College has been one that we've referred out to directly. Um, but a lot of our business does stop at the door. I'm unfortunate, fortunately, have to tell you that we, I mean, we will try to help someone with a job. We will try to provide them resources. If they call us, they know our case managers, they know our people, and we will try to connect them. But most of our services stop. But uh, the GED, when we look at that, is uh, the pre release program in itself requires everyone to have a college uh, or to requires people to start working towards a GED if you don't have one, unless you're over the age of 45. That's our, but, but, but yes, we, those connection points. Once released, is it's not see ya, forget about ya. We want, we do try to do better. We need to do better. I, I don't know how that will look, but it's something we can talk and I can brief you further. We get there. You know, I was at one of those GED uh, graduations a couple of years back. I mean, I've been to several, and, and the speaker at that time uh, said, you know, no U turns. We don't want you back. You know, you got your GED, you know, continue to work on this uh, to do what's necessary, but we don't want you back. And that's the truth. We want them, a person that's had their issues, to get themselves straightened out and to stay straightened out. And I, and I do want to thank you for raising the issues about looking at the demographics and, and Ms. Farad looking at the demographics of those who are incarcerated with serious mental illness because, again, it reflects lack of access to certain types of care in the community overall and racial disparities in accessing early behavioral health interventions in the community, which is a bigger, broader problem. Mm -hmm. This is the piece then that you all are responsible for and have to deal with. But we recognize, again, as part of the sequential intercept model analysis, this is a bigger, broader issue that requires a lot of hands on deck and a lot of interdisciplinary work to rectify. And, and I would like to add that I believe it's important for you all to know is when we had three um, what we believe and what will be medical related fatalities in, yes, in, in three days. I just I, I want to put that on the table. We had the National Institute of Corrections bring us a consultant to do a complete audit of all our medical and mental health services so we can see where there may be gaps, where we need to do better, and what were what were the possible reasons on this. And that report is not official yet, but I have it and I received it this week. We will be reviewing on that and whatever I can share I, or I will share. But we, we have a focus and, and Division Chief Murphy as well as our whole team, uh, we, we definitely want to make sure that we're serving them the best because it's, it's, fr it's frustrating and we're not the only part that's helping reduce recidivism. A lot of people think it's corrections. It's, it's community, it's our service providers, it's us working as a team. And so uh, we are working towards. Uh, I, I can very publicly say thank you because I, 
I have been to to uh, your facility, uh, and thank goodness I got to leave right away. But I've been to your facility, and and you all do things with with in, in a very humanistic way. I've spoken to to former inmates. I've spoken to people who you know I, I knew for years. People who have who work in there in various forms, and they'll say it wasn't just put on because we were there. It's every day. And, and that's an impressive thing. And, it, and I know there's never a time that there's not an issue, but we, we uh, are very impressed and we, and we thank you for all that you do. And if, are we? We're done. I wasn't recommending any changes in the executive's recommended budget. I just wanted to note I forgot to put the 3% inflationary increase for nonprofit service providers. That will be on the new slash enhanced programs list. And we're going to put an asterisk with it. Yep. We're yeah. good? good? So you got a 3 0 on that one as well. Thank you all. I want to thank you all for, for your support, your thoughtful questions, suggestions where we can improve. And I also want to just acknowledge my team. Mm -hmm. uh, our team for corrections is very dedicated. They're here where we, we work closely together. And I'll tell you, it, I, I, I couldn't ask for a better team than I have up here with me. So well, we're glad. We mm -hmm. thank all of you for everything. Very much so. Very good. Next is fire and rescue, please. What you do now? <laughs> huh. Well, that'll come through there, but your budget. Welcome <laughs> to the seventh floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing that didn't work or does work. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good morning again, and uh, Chief Cooper, if you could please introduce yourself and your group, and we'll get started. Uh, good morning. My name is Gary Cooper. I'm currently serving as the interim fire chief of Montgomery County Fire. Dominic Del Pozo, Fiscal Management Division Chief, MCFRS. D. Good morning. I'm Dee Howard Richards, Division Chief for Administrative Services. Good morning. Melissa Schultz, Planning Manager. Good morning. Michael Kelly, Division Chief, Volunteer Services. And behind you, you have a <laughs> fellow by the name of Tweety wow. Petey. Tweety, yeah. Tweety Petey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Willie, this is your show. I mean, do you have an office someplace else? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Willie Morales, Management and Budget. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Frog, please. Sure. Um, for fire, the recommended FY25 operating budget reflects a 9.72% increase over last year's approved budget. Um, there are a lot of uh, new programs and a lot of identified same services adjustments. But as I always do, I'm going to start with the address addressing structural deficiencies. Yep. I know I sound like a broken record about overtime. They also have minimum staffing requirements to make the trucks actually run, to get out there and provide the services. They know exactly how many people they need to run the apparatus they have and how many, um, you know, how many people they've got now and how much overtime they're going to have to use. So um, Fire and Rescue currently has 1,246 career firefighters and approximately 790 active volunteers who must meet the daily minimum staffing requirements of the 318 seats. Um, to meet these requirements, they've maintained this structural overtime deficit since fiscal year 17, and they've averaged about $7.8 million over budget each year in overtime costs. Recently, those overages have been addressed in a supplemental appropriation, and one is expected later this year for FY24 overages. And obviously, some overtime is necessary and efficient for a 24-7 public safety operation. You don't want to have, you know, nothing but staff with no overtime working. That's not the most um, appropriate way to staff. Um, but ha relying on it too much can um, exacerbate other staffing problems like increased call outs. So I've got a chart on page five of historic overtime cost overruns in the millions. Um, and this goes back to a 2018 county stat report on net annual work hour update. 
um, where they indicated that the department needed an additional 180 career firefighter positions to achieve their minimum staffing requirements at that time. Um, there have been approximately 55 firefighter positions added over the past several years, but unfortunately this has not really made a dent in the overtime. Um, there's various types of new leave, including pandemic-related administrative leave, there's new parental leave, and those have impacted daily uh, staffing. And while this discussion surrounding such extensive overtime have focused on the budget, it may, the use of it may also detrimentally impact staff. If staff, staff are not voluntarily signing up for the overtime, then the department may require forced holds, and if that's a regular practice, it could actually lead to the use of more paid leave and, of course, create its own vicious cycle of perpetuating overages. Um, I also put a chart in here to show some context of overtime earnings in calendar 2023. The top 24 overtime earners in the department each earned more than $100,000 in overtime. Um, there's a chart on page six also to show which categories of operations are driving most of the overtime and 74% of it is in field operations. Another 12% is at the training academy and about 5% of the overtime is used for the emergency communications center. Um, the good news, I think, is that the department is currently conducting a net annual work hour study of its own, which is why Ms. Schultz, planning manager, is here in case you have any questions. Um, this will more accurately assess their staffing needs to provide the services that they say they're going to provide. Um, I think that this will be ready in time for budget development for FY26, but I highly recommend uh, to the committee to have FIRE come back and report its findings out so we have a better understanding of what they actually need um, to provide the services to the community. I, I certainly agree with that. Is, is there a time frame, I guess we're, we're looking at you, Ms. Schultz, but is there a time frame when we would be able to get an update on this? We'll be ready by the fall. By the fall. Okay. Good. We're good on that. I have a Go ahead, please. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, but particularly about one of the stations in my district where there's been ongoing concerns about staffing. Should we hold that? Or? Yeah, I would. It, okay. It's coming. There's a three stations that were okay. that you're mentioning. So thank you. Yeah, and I have a feeling I know which station you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go <laughs> ahead, please. The next item is early detection cancer screening for about a million dollars. Um, this benefit is new and it was included in the latest collective bargaining agreement with IAFF, uh, which is the union that supports the uniformed firefighters. Um, my apologies, the screenings will not be conducted at FROMS under the current uh, Concentra contract, but instead I've been advised that they will be reimbursed by their regular providers. Is that correct? I mean, they'll be reimbursed for seeking these services at their regular providers. That's correct. Up to $800 okay. annually. Okay. And there's a list of the different types of cancer screenings available on page 7. Mm -hmm. For the high school cadet program, $616,000. You just reviewed this as a supplemental appropriation, I believe, in the fall. Um, and it expanded the high school cadet program, which is a partnership with MCPS. And they had been just providing EMS sir, um instruction for one year and they've expanded that to include fire so it's a two-year program now there's a breakdown of the demographics of the um, enrolled cadets on page eight for your review there's total enrollment of 38 um, students at this time and, and this is strictly a high school program right is there anything that, that our friends from Montgomery College I know they're going to be real tickled with me because I'm looking for all this work for them is there anything that our friends from Montgomery College could be doing to help out in this area as well uh, we'll have to discuss that internally okay I you know the more we can do I, I as you know the police have had all these issues trying to find people and it's my understanding that in criminal justice at Montgomery College right now, they they have 500 plus students. Well, if we can if we can work towards doing that, then that would take go a long way to take care of our concerns. So, anyhow, please internally discuss it. Okay. The next one's failures to respond at Station 40, and this yes. adds about $573,000 to add six career firefighter positions to that station to help mitigate failures to respond. Um, this station has struggled with volunteer staffing for several years. The minimum staffing they need is nine firefighters to staff 
um, three for a tower, four for an engine, and two for an ambulance. The engine and truck are staffed 24-7 by career firefighters, and the ambulance is staffed by career firefighters during the day and volunteers on nights and weekends. The tower there has failed 149 times over the past five years, and the ambulance has failed to respond 123 times over the same period. Um, Fire and Rescue has added staffing and overtime to Station 40 um, to assist with failures to respond in the past. In FY16, they added 344,008 FTEs to staff one position during the day and three positions on nights and weekends. In FY23, the budget added 852,004 um, full-time positions. In FY24, the budget added $100,000 in backfill overtime to help staff nights and weekends. There are also failures to respond at other stations. They provided a list of those failures to respond in calendar 2023. Um, the, obviously, Station 40 is addressed in this budget, but Stations 15 and 17 also appear to have. I need to stop. 40 is Sandy Spring, yes. 15 is Burtonsville, and 17 is Laytonsville. Correct. Go ahead. Um, and if additional career staffing is needed there, overtime costs will increase, which is another reason this net annual work hour study is really important. The employment landscape and the volunteer landscape are both changing, right? And it's important to be flexible and nimble enough to really understand what is the most appropriate way to uh, staff this combined service. So. Councilmember Lukey, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, we are incredibly grateful that we have a combined service, but yep. also knowing that the volunteer component is just as challenged as the career component in finding people to, to want to do this, right? Um, and since this isn't a, a new issue, and I know the study's ongoing, and you said you'll be prepared to talk about it by the fall, but, um, and certainly, where based on the situation where, where my district, the eastern side of my district is located, Burtonsville is in, in Councilmember Mink's district, but also adjacent to my district, right? And then we've got Sandy Spring and Laytonsville. If you're looking at a line of a, a wide geographic area that, that is covered by three volunteer departments. Um, and, uh, you know, what, if anything, can you say presently, knowing that the study will be completed um, later, are the things that you would need from us, from county government in order to help support closing this gap. So with Station 40 at Sandy Spring, the additional eight FTEs that the county mm -hmm. guy recommended will virtually eliminate failures to respond there. Okay. I say the word virtually. Right. Um, there are times where, unfortunately, the, there could be a failure to respond. We are currently working with the leadership of the Burtonsville Volunteer Fire Department. They have just uh, approached us asking for staffing assistance. So we're working through that with them now. We imagine uh, that'll take us some time to go back and forth. We have yet to hear from Laytonsville. Okay. And um, Chief Kelly, is there anything that you can add to this in terms of are there any policies or procedures within the volunteer departments that are either helping or hurting in closing this gap? Um, well, I, I think that, um, first of all, all the volunteer departments are competing for the same people. Right. There are some departments that require an overnight stay, and uh, Sandy Spring is, is one of those. Burtonsville is one of those. And other departments don't require that. They require them to come in for a shift early evening until late in the evening, uh, and then they can go home. That can play a big part in volunteer as a student right. um, that, uh, or, and, and for working. And there's always that gap between 5.30 in the morning until 7, till the new shifts come on, and in the evening um, when the shifts, the daytime shifts leave at 5 o'clock and volunteers can't necessarily get there right, right away. Yeah. And I think that's, that's across the county. Um, and then also across the county, highly trained volunteers get hired. Right. Um, and that is something that they have to fill the gap in. So um, they're, all, they're all working, they're all recruiting, and they're doing a good job bringing people in, doing their best they can to get them trained. Um, and the call load has increased, especially right. Sandy Spring, mostly south of the station, yep. uh, going into Norbeck area. Yep. You know that. And so um, that increased the call load, higher percentage possibly of failures to respond. And, and I know, and I do know, and I want to commend Sandy Spring for, for doing its community days and promoting that and being out there and trying to educate the community about 
how you can join, how you can participate, trying to talk to kids about getting involved with the volunteer service. And, um, you know, so I, I do appreciate their um, reach into the community. Thank you. And, and I'm going to call on Councilmember Mink in two seconds. But can you explain what failure to respond, what happens when there's a failure to respond? Essentially what happens is when we are informed that there's not appropriate staffing for the apparatus. So there's a dispatch. Somebody calls in and says, I need, I need you all. So yes. At the start of the 911 call, the yeah. operator determines the level of service required, and they dispatch that. At some point in time, either somebody in the station notifies us they don't have the appropriate qualified personnel to take that unit, or there's nobody in the station. Uh, I believe it's a five-minute mark where if we don't hear from them, we, we fail them, and we dispatch the next closest. So we still respond. It's oh, yes. not a failure to yeah. respond in, in entirety. It's, it's the failure from that. I, I wanted the public to be yeah. aware that sorry. it doesn't mean we're just going to say we're sorry. Right. Yeah. That specific unit fails. We send a supplemental unit. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to... Um, Note that um, I think it was, a, in a, it was in a previous session where one of the issues that we talked about that was related to uh, recruitment and retention on the volunteer side was about if there are ways that we could uh, enhance the integration of the volunteer side into the training uh, programs and um, if we could improve the scheduling there and, and try to find more flexibility, try to uh, incorporate more um, uh, volunteers into the instruction and, and some of those sorts of things. So I wanted to check in on how those conversations are going. So they're moving. Uh, we've had noted improvements uh, brought to our attention from the MCVFRA. Uh, but it's, as you know, it's a work in progress. And scheduling is always a challenge when it comes to two separate groups. Got it. Okay. Well, yeah, I think we'll be eager to hear about those continued yeah. conversations because that's an area where we do have some, some control. There's Obviously, there's only so many improvements that can be made. But uh, the more we can think creatively and collaboratively and find some of those spaces, uh, since that's not something that is directly impacted by our ability to find the, the people, but rather to, to keep the people who might be interested in making sure that we are uh, bringing them into the fold as, as quickly as possible. Um, and um, so it would be great to, to loop back on that and be interested in to hear some of the details on the progress that you've already made. That's great. Um, and then on another topic, I'm just going to note that I know that there are certain areas where we are seeing a waste of, our, um, of the time of some of our uh, folks who are being dispatched through no fault of your own. And I'll give uh, one particular example with the Enclave apartment building. Um, where the failure of management there uh, to provide proper security services and cameras and concierge folks means that there are folks who are pulling the alarms there uh, all the time. And there's, of course, other causes there that are completely outside of your control. Um, they have not updated some of their... Um, there are elevators, um, and so there is difficulty with the recall functionality there. And so I just want to note that for the record, there's nothing that you all are able to do about that, um, uh, but it's incumbent on, on us and on our uh, partners out there to make sure that we are doing what we can on the enforcement side to, to make those folks uh, make the improvements that they need to do so that you all can be responding to high priority calls and not spending time uh, dealing with inadequate facilities. So I just wanted to note that for the record. Go ahead, please. I was just going to say thank you for the acknowledgement. Well, is there, is there anything we can do to help coordinate uh, permitting or whoever is supposed to be going out there and saying, hey, you, you got to get your act together. Is there anything we can do from the council side to, to help out on that? So I think the partnerships throughout the county agencies are working and working well. Okay. Uh, I think we spent a great deal of time over the last couple of years to, to further build upon those. Uh, we have open dialogues, constant open dialogues now, specifically to those issues that you brought up. Uh, Thank you for the offer. Can I get back to you on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully we'll all be here. 
I'll, I'll note that specifically on the Enclave apartment building, which is particularly problematic, but of course not the only one, right. that I really want to commend um, all of you and the county uh, in general because I know that there is a, a, a loose task force that has been convened uh, to bring together the various partners from the different departments and, and relevant agencies uh, and also making sure that Department of Labor, for example, on the, ele on the elevators uh, are looped into some of those key conversations. So much appreciation there uh, to all of you and to our, our additional partners partners, including state. Okay. Ms. Farag, please. The next item adds three firefighters to the Fire and Explosive Investigation Division for about $287,000, and it provides, um, it's due to a recently executed memo of agreement with the IAFF to adjust the staffing model in that division. Historically, it had been staffed with four captains and eight lieutenants assigned to a 40-hour work week, 42-hour work week. And the new model is reducing the number of captains and lieutenants and adding lower ranking staff with police powers. It also adds three firefighters without police powers as cause and origin investigators. Okay. The next item is medical assistance at FROMS, which is Fire and Rescue Occupational Medical Services. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For $200,000. And it's adding two medical assistants there. Um, Fire and Rescue has advised that it needs approximately 500 more appointment slots to meet the goals of the adopted National Fire Protection Association standard for yearly examinations. The department is limited by its nurse staffing and can't adequately move patients through the exam process, perform testing, and monitor the employees during testing. Current staffing is at five or six nurses each day, and this will help um, reduce that backlog. Good. COVID booster for 134000 This came over as a supplemental appropriation as well. I don't think it's been acted on yet. It has gone to public hearing and public safety uh, works. I, I don't think it's been acted. No. Yeah. Um, we're close. We, we had our hearing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're close. The increase reflects um, the recent collective bargaining agreement provision. Uh, the same, obviously, the same amount was recommended in the FY24 operating budget through the supplemental appropriation. They're also establishing a new emergency medical service duty officer for 125000 This increase adds a fourth EMS duty officer in the field. It is funded with ESPP funds. Don't ask me what that is, emergency. Okay. It's the reimbursement structure from the state due to a Medicaid plan amendment, and it's 100% federal funds. Do you know what ESPP stands for, Don? Okay. <laughs> um, it's a Jeopardy question. Yes. One um, is, yeah. The position will work to improve health outcomes in diverse areas of the county. Uh, they currently have three EMS duty officers on each shift. They advise that this new position will have the same duties as the others, but it'll provide increased supervision and presence of enhanced clinical oversight on more of the department's more complex medical calls. Uh, these duty officers are also able to perform certain advanced procedures that other paramedics cannot, and they can use ultrasounds and will be able to initiate blood transfusions. What it stands for. What is, what is stand okay. for? Okay. ESPP Emergency Service Transporter Supplemental Payment Program. Thank you. All right. Thank you, to Thank you for my team. <laughs> Government can't be simple. That's right. Yeah. When I uh, Googled it, it came up as Eastern Mountain Sports. So I just went <laughs> to, I don't, I don't want to brag. I don't want to brag. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, the next item is a fire camp for girls for $100,000. This new program focuses on decreasing the gender disparity in the department's career staffing by exposing girls and women to firefighting and ultimately employing more women in the department. The fire camp will be held at the Public Safety Training Academy from July 22nd through the 29th this summer, and it's free of charge. Girls and women between the ages of 16 to 21 may participate, and the department hopes to have approximately 18 to 24 participants. Terrific. Mm -hmm. LAPS, um, last year the budget had increased LAPS across most departments while examining long-term vacancies. Last year's LAPS was about $4.7 million. The recommended LAPS for this year um, has a couple of changes. It restores 816000 LAPS taken last year, and it has a LAPS adjustment of $2.9 million. That is reflecting civilian lapsed positions only. Holiday pay for $1.1 million. That adds Election Day and Inauguration. It also adds funding for the previously added Juneteenth holiday. There are two position shifts. These are two vacant positions. One is going to Human Resources and one is going to the Office of Labor Relations um, to support countywide efforts in both of those offices. 
The risk management adjustment is almost, um, it's 973000 The total risk management budget for FY25 is $13.2 million. Expenditures decreased because there is an investment income in the risk management fund, which was higher than anticipated, and that has resulted in a one-time return of fund contributions to certain departments. This reduction is for FY25 only, so it may be significantly different in FY26. The ESPP funds. Um, this is a relatively new program that stems from the state Medicaid plan amendment. The department receives enhanced reimbursements for ambulance transport of patients with Medicaid. The department anticipates receiving approximately $14.7 million in FY25. The executive has designated 15% of this new funding to be distributed to the local fire and rescue departments in a manner similar to the emergency man management services, medical services, transportation fees. All the typos I get to catch now. Yeah. And for FY25, the department anticipates distributing $2.2 million to the LFRDs. And there's a table on page 10. This is a relatively new income, as I said, FY22 and on. And the LFRDs have been receiving 15% or have been budgeted to receive 15% for the past several fiscal years. They need to develop a plan on how they're going to use this funding in the same manner that they do with the EMST funds. And we get you get a report on that every six months. And um, they are just now in March of this year, they've distributed the FY22 money for about $1.4 million. Um, I've recommended this for the past couple of years based largely on the overtime structural deficit. Um, but oh, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm recommending adding as a budget resolution language that requires the department to report the use of these funds and disbursement amounts to LFRDs in a manner similar to the EMST report. And there's a list of what the um, LFRDs are going to use the FY22 money for on pages 11 and 12. But I'm also recommending using the funds for this year, FY25, to address the structural deficit. Given the department's long-term structural budget deficits along with the continued use of reserves to fund known personnel costs, this new funding source should be used to address overtime overages rather than be distributed to the LFRDs. And while volunteers are a critical part of the combined service, the fiscal health of the combined service as is compromised by the ongoing structural deficit as well as by the large amount of overtime burden placed on staff. And unlike the EMST funding, which the department is required by law to distribute to the LFRDs, there is no legal requirement to designate any portion of this fund for the volunteers. I am recommending pausing this distribution for this year only um, for two reasons. One, to have time to catch up to understand what they can actually spend the money on and report out, but also the net annual work hour survey again or study again um, to better assess what type of staffing we need because it all does link to the overtime. And if the committee chooses to follow this recommendation, it would increase the overtime budget from 20 million to 22.2 million to help reduce next year's deficit. Um, it does not change total budgeted costs, so it will not reflect those savings, but it will help mitigate future supplemental appropriation requests for a similar amount. And I sincerely appreciate what you're saying. I'd, I'd like to, and I don't know how we can do it uh, through the budget right now, but I'd like to ask, uh, have a discussion with the, with the volunteers as well before we do that. I think we need a, a plan that that they need to be a part of not and and with their career people as well sitting down and figuring out if if they need somebody at at, at sandy spring how they're going to help us pay for that over time or or i'm not just picking on sandy spring but the, that and as you had mentioned in your packet but i do think rather than do it without them sitting at the table we should have them sitting at the table. And I know that their agreement is being worked on now. I don't know, you know, we're not a party to that, but how is that going to fit into this? Hmm? You? Uh, yeah, Chief. I don't, I don't believe the ongoing um, negotiations have a direct reflection on the funding for the ESPP. Um, I will add that of the of the 15 departments that are listed as receiving right. money, 12 of those are putting that money toward replacing ambulance, and that would likely have a direct impact on our capital budget when it comes to countywide replacing ambulances. So I think the, the, the funds are certainly going back into the system as anticipated. 
Well, and that's the other thing. I mean, you know, we talk about capital and operating. Money's money. And regardless of where you spend it, you spent it. Uh, and so I, I just believe we need to have the, the larger discussion with, with them sitting at the table as well. So I don't know where anybody else is. Can we pull that out as a yeah. separate? Yeah, I would, that's what I would hope. We could, yeah. For a future decision point once we've had the opportunity to hear from the volunteers? Or do you just want to address it at full council when we take it up as a work session then? Well, but are they going to, are the volunteers going to be able to get back to us that quickly? I think we should pause on it. You think what? Yeah, this seems worthy of, a, of another real conversation to make sure that we, we do this right. Like, is it, sorry. Is there a way to kind of hold it off to the side and we will figure out whether, logistically speaking, we have the opportunity to bring the volunteers back to one of our upcoming public safety work sessions um, or whether we're able to address that at full council. Right now, sitting here, I don't know that the three of us know the answer to that and yeah. we would be relying on you to figure that out over the next day or so, but. I, mean, I can ask the clerk to see if we can schedule some time on a future public safety committee work. Okay. I, I think yeah. that would be okay. what I would feel more comfortable doing uh, and, and, and go from there. Okay. And then we, you know, it, it, somehow in this budget, this money is going to get spent. We're not, mm -hmm. not going to leave any money on the table. So this money is going to get spent. The question is how how much it would have to be written out on what we're doing and how we're doing it. But anyhow, please. Yeah, I, I think that's the right thing to do. And whether, whether we need to um, bring everybody to the table in a session and have a large conversation there or whether we can have conversations mm -hmm. Uh, outside a session and then just vote it through at a future at a future committee session right. uh, I think is TBD but at least we'll have our, our options open to, to decide that within the next few days. And TBD means to be <laughs> determined. Oh yes, to be determined. Yeah, yes, okay. All the hip we That's know. my <laughs> shtick that I don't like the initials without somebody explaining what they are. I was teasing you, <laughs> however. Yeah. yeah. Are we good? Are you? Anything else, Ms. Farag? I do. The EMST funds, these re, um, require two reports. It's actually in budget resolution language to require two reports um, to you. There's a provision requiring semi-annual reports on health data in addition to call and transport data. And I've got the reports attached for your review, but if you look further down on the page, on page 13, there are two provisions there that the fire department can never get data on because they are hospital-based data, and in one circumstance that hospitals don't want to share because of confidentiality issues, um, the other one they just can't get to. And those include mortality rates for STEMI incidents, and the other one is patients with heart attack or stroke symptoms at emergency departments that were not transported by ambulance. Fire and rescue can't get those. I am recommending that this language in the FY25 resolution be removed and leave the rest of the report um, as is. And, and I have no problem with what you just said. Do we need legislation to do that? How does that work? That part's, I mean, there's a part on reporting the call transport numbers and stuff that the fire and rescue has, and that's in the law, and that's still going to remain in the budget resolution language. So we don't need to change anything legislative. I'm fine with that. Are you good? Yeah, yeah. we're good. And then for racial equity and social justice, the master plan, which you approved, which you reviewed and approved over the yeah. past several months, it takes a very different approach to fire and rescue planning by taking community vulnerability and resilience into account with, with when allocating finite county resources. And I think that's really important. They are really acknowledging that we don't have all the money in the world to provide all the services that we want. So how do you best reconfigure services to ensure that the most vulnerable residents in the community are getting the services they need when they need them. And the master plan is filled with that, and I've taken one excerpt out for your review. Um, while the master plan does emphasize vulnerability and the need to build resilience, it doesn't specifically address race, um, but there's much overlap, um, which is, and I point out, as illustrated by the Montgomery Planning's new community equity index, which I will get into much more in depth in the police budget. The department's approach to planning is more flexible and it focuses on building both departmental and community resilience for both risk reduction and more effective fire and rescue response. This approach can be expanded to better understand how race often overlaps with community vulnerability as the department further operationalizes its racial equity um, efforts. Uh, it's got a couple of 
um, items that you've, you've reviewed today, the new EMS duty officer, which is intending to improve health outcomes in diverse areas of the county, but they also added a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer in last year's budget, and it's my understanding that the candidate has been selected. I don't know if they've actually been hired yet. Um, and also the operating budget and equity tool that all departments have undergone this year, they scored a seven out of 11, which indicates commitment to racial equity work. Um, I'm recommending that the budget be other than the one ESPP fund thing that we have deferred and we'll come back to. Um, recommending that the rest of the budget be approved as submitted by the executive. There is a new and enhanced program list on page 15. It has three items that are new. I need to also add the two medical assistants at Fromm's. I've been instructed to add that. We were kind of doing the final touches on our master list on Friday, and I had already published my staff report. So there will be four items on that list. And, and I'm good with that. Are we? Yeah. Yes? You got a 3 on that. Yeah. And, and there again, unless you, do you have any final statement on this budget? Uh, thank you. I just want to let you know we feel very excited about the kind of executive's recommended, recommended budget and feel it will improve our ability to support our overall mission going forward. Well, well thank you. And, and there again, I've said this for, I could say this pretty much for any department, but I've said it several times today. Thank you all for everything you do. You, you save lives on an, on an hourly basis, and I know you never get enough thanks, but, but we sincerely appreciate it. And, and I have often said that it, especially in Montgomery County, you can't say that for everywhere, but especially in Montgomery County, when someone shows up to save your life, they're there with good equipment and, and good personnel and good training and everything that's necessary. Can't get any better than that. So thank you all, and please thank everyone that works for your department. Okay, we're good. It's a 3-0. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.